We're going to continue our discussion of haloalkanes, that is, this idea of a carbon-halogen bond. Again, this unique partial positive, partial negative bond uh, gives us a lot of reactivity. We've already seen SN2 reactions, and so now we're going to start looking at some additional reactions. Let's review SN2 reactions so far. So one of the things is that we saw that these guys are bimolecular. That is, SN2 reactions are bimolecular meaning that both the concentration of the nucleophile and the substrate, so the organic part, is important for the kinetics. So we refer to that as bimolecular. Increasing the concentration of either one of those increases uh, the rate. We also saw that it's a one-step reaction, has two arrows, uh, but it occurs all in one step, and so we say that that's concerted, all right, so it happens together. Also, when we saw that there was a reaction, we had an R, it always converted into S. And so we always got inversion uh, configuration, and that was important. We saw that in that last chapter that methyl and primary reacted the fastest, secondary and tertiary the slowest. That was relatively what happened in lab, is that we generally saw primaries react faster, and that these guys react slower. In some cases, there might be a leaving group effect that would change that a little bit, but in general, we saw that trend of what's happening. All right, so um, what we're going to find out, however, is that that's what's happened so far, but we're getting a slightly different type of reaction that's occurring here. All right, so in this one, we find out that the solvent actually is serving as the nucleophile, so it's called solvolysis. Where does that come from? Well, solvo comes from the, the term solvent, all right, so that gives that, that part of the word. And then lysis means to break or to chop. Um, and so this one's really just helping uh, to break the molecule up. And the solvent really is just then reacting with the molecule once the bond breaks and sort of encouraging that process to occur. So overall, this will refer to always as solvolysis. If we happen to have water as the solvent, um, because water is so prevalent, we would refer to this as hydrolysis. So hydrolysis is just a specific type of solvolysis that involves water. All right, so this is the one thing that really has its own name, own type of solvolysis, which would be this one. So let's take a look at overall what this might look like, and that we get this H3 methyl group, and we get a couple of those, okay, in fact, three of them that are attached to this carbon group, and then we have a bromine. So again, you might think about, all right, is this carbon, is it primary, secondary, or tertiary? Well, of course, it's tertiary. It has three carbon groups attached to it, and then we have this bromine that's attached to it as well. If we would stick this in water, all right, and it would be you know, decently soluble in water, then water could react with it. And not only would it water react with it, but it would actually happen fairly fast. All right, so we would not generally need to stick it in a water bath and all of that that we've seen before, that this would react fairly fast, and that was sort of in contrast to what happened in SN2, where this one would be really slow under SN2 conditions. Of course, water is a polar protic solvent. If this would occur, we would get uh, this alcohol that formed, and then the H and the Br would be there. So we would be, end up losing this hydrogen bromine. Those would come together as an acid, and then we would end up with this alcohol. So the fact that this is forming fast, that the tertiary group is tertiary halogen is re reacting. Uh, so this means this happens by a different mechanism than SN2. And in fact, what we would see is that this is going to be called SN1. So these are union molecular nucleophilic substitutions, which we refer to as SN1. A couple of things about them is that their, um, their solvolysis, their rate is the first order. It just depends on the substrate, the RI here, but this could really be RX. So it's really an understood first order. Uh, that's occurring. Um, unlike SN2, where we saw that R always goes to S, these reactions are not stereospecific. That is, what we're going to find out is that um, if we start off with an R, we're going to get a mixture of R and S in antimers in the end, which is interesting new. We also find out that uh, the tertiary and the secondary are going to react the quickest, and that these guys are going to be slower overall. All right, so they're um, not really going to uh, react that fast as the primary and the methyl. And in fact, this, this table 7.1 highlights, really it makes it even more obvious that uh, if we look at the relative rates, so if we take the rate of how fast a methyl and really a primary react, and we set that at 1, and then we say, all right, how much faster 
do these guys, if we set them to 1, are the other two. So this one's about 12 times faster, and this one's a million times, effectively. All right, so, so in this one, just reminding you, this would be the tertiary group. This is the secondary. So these are faster than the primary and methyl, um, and clearly the, the, the tertiary group is even more fast uh, than the secondary, or so significantly faster. Let's take a look at this reaction a little bit more in depth. All right, so we have our carbon. All right, so we have this again. Think about it. All right, is this uh, with this many carbons? Is this, is this one a primary, secondary, or tertiary? Of course, it's tertiary because we have three groups attached to it. We're going to call this compound one in general. Um, however, specifically, this is a propane compound, so it's 2-bromo, two 2-methyl two propane. What happens in this mechanism if this guy, this bond breaks? As you can imagine, just having a covalent bond break uh, is not that uh, favorable. So if we add some energy, uh, such as some heat and those types of things, this will break a little bit uh, quicker. Uh, so it starts to break, and however, this is a relatively slow step. All right, so this part of the whole mechanism. Some of the other ones are faster, but this step is slow. And so as a result, we actually get uh, the bromine that's going away during the transition state. It's our double dagger. And so again, this is already partially positive, partially negative. All right, but it's becoming even more partially positive and negative. Um, as it goes through. So again, we're just breaking it down. So all reactions have a transition state, and we're just showing uh, this particular one. Again, since it's a transition state, we can use the same arrows to indicate where the equilibrium lies. Again, this little arrow meaning that there's not as much forward progress, which is, but if we add heat and that type of thing, we can make it go a little bit uh, faster and a little bit more this way, but primarily uh, this would be the main direction of the equilibrium. All right, so we continue that since it's really the same reaction. Uh, I'm sorry, all the same, well, same reaction, but same reaction step. Uh, we get our product, CH3, that in this particular stage is that we end up with what we call a carbocation. Put a little circle around that positive charge, plus we get the VR. It goes away. All right, so with a pair of electrons, that it comes from that. And so we see that overall, and then actually we could show overall if we wanted to all of the electrons that the bromine has. Uh, but uh, so we see that that is forming this carbocation. So by the way, let me add in some numbers here. So we call this our number two species, and this third one, which we call the carbocation. All right, so we can label this a couple of ways. Carbocation, so a carbon with a positive charge added to it. We might also, uh, as another term, generally that we would call this would be an intermediate. All right, so specifically, this is a carbocation. It's carbon has a positive charge, all right, but it's also an intermediate. So just another term uh, that you might call it. So again, just why we have a couple of terms, well, you know, think about if you're calling something a car, all right, well, what kind of car does he have? Well, he might have a sedan or a sports car, all right, so these are just giving different types of grittiness to describing this, all right, so we say it's a carbocation, we also generally say that this is an intermediate step. So it's one step, uh, one, number one, going to two to three, and this is isolated. Uh, you can isolate carbocations, so we call it intermediate. Two is not an intermediate, it's a transition state. Um, so, but this one's a carbocation, and we can continue on from there. All right, so uh, a couple of things about this. Let's talk about number one a little bit more. Um, why do tertiary groups... Why are they favorable here for this reaction and to form carbocations, one and three? Well, we might remember it has to do with hyperconjugation. That is a term, hyperconjugation, that we talked about back with uh, radical reactions. And remember, that was the idea that we had these three R groups, three R groups here, uh, which had some electron density to basically to give to this carbon to help form this carbocation. So once it forms a positive charge, Carbon isn't as stable with a positive charge, so electron density can be provided sort of through the air, through space, uh, to that carbon to help stabilize that. So it provides some negative charge, which stabilizes that. And that happens through hyperconjugation. All right, so we've seen that term before. Um, so again, this is a fairly slow reaction. We said, again, it's heterolytic bond breaking. We saw a little bit of that in a curved arrow handout, so that's important. 
uh, to think about that. Um, again, this is a transition state. It's going to be three steps, and so we're going to end up with three transition states. And then finally, about this carbocation in this step, we, it's basically, it ends up being a really positive, um, real, well, I'm sorry, a real positive charge, but as a result, because of the positive charge, it has, it's a powerful electrophile. All right, so it's a really powerful electrophile because it has a dense positive charge and allows other electron species to come and to attack it. All right, and so we see that. Um, so one of the things that we can do is that also, that in some detail, is that this um, carbocation, um, if we draw it out, all right, so it's going to have some positive charge as a result of this empty p orbital. All right, and so probably shouldn't put the positive charge right there in the p orbital, but I'll put it right there with the carbon. All right, and that's because, again, it would have a methyl group. That's here, CH3. And so notice, you might have remember seeing this before, and then we'll go straight up with another CH3. So it's really forming this SP2-like hybridization state, and that's also trigonal planar. All right, so um, it has that type of work because, again, it's lost a pair of electrons. It now only has six electrons. It's, partial, it's a carbocation, has this empty P orbital, and has these three guys around it. All right, so that's important. And again, this is the intermediate. This is the carbocation intermediate. Again, a powerful electrophile because of this positive charge, empty p orbital, which allows it to accept additional electrons. All right, so this is that first step um, in the mechanism. And that's really dissociation of this, of this uh, bromine group. All right, and so we're going to continue on, and we'll redraw this on the next step. One of the things that I will not redraw is the bromine because it's a leaving group. It just goes out into the water solvent, and it becomes a spectator ion, and it's also the inorganic uh, products. We're not as concerned about that in the next step. One last thing that we'll talk about before we move on to that next step is that the fact that this is a slow step, and the other steps we're going to talk about are faster. Well, the analogy is that we imagine water flowing through a pipe, and in this pipe there are a couple places where the pipe narrows, and those are constrictions and, of course, when you have a restriction, that will re restrict uh, constriction, but it restricts the water flow. All right, and so some of these are bigger than others, and so it doesn't restrict the flow as much. But this particular constriction restricts the water flow even more uh, because it's much more narrow. And so we might say that water can't get any faster through this pipe than it can flow through this really narrow area. And that's really the rate-determining step has a lower K value. Well, what does that have to do with it? Well, this first step, since it's a slow, it's like the area of biggest constriction, and so the water doesn't flow through the pipe as fast there. As after it gets through this tight area, the next constrictions are much lower, are much small. Well, well, I'm sorry, the constrictions um, they're not as bad, and so then the water flows faster, and so they don't tighten down on that. So, and that's really what happens in this mechanism. This first step is the the most narrow, the slowest, and then these other ones are a little bit slower. Uh, than generally the pipe, but they're much faster than this little uh, constriction here. And that's really what's happening, is that this first step is the rate limiting step, and then these other ones, while they might be narrower uh, than the original pipe, nonetheless the water is able to flow through them. So the second step involves this powerful electrophile that we've been able to generate known as a carbocation. We'll redraw this. To show here. Remember, we call this carbocation, also the intermediate, number three. Well, what happens in this second step is this is where the solvolysis comes in. This is where water, acting as the solvent and the nucleophile, uh, can react. All right, so again, it's electrophile, so it loves electrons. Well, guess what? Oxygen has some electrons there, and it's willing to accept those. All right, so what happens to any one of these pair of electrons can come in and really attack that carbon. They're attracted to that carbon because of the positive charge. All right, and so it acts, yeah. So, the, so if this is the strong and powerful electrophile, this would be a good nucleophile, looking for the nucleus of the positive charge, and that is the water. Well, it starts to react, and so when it reacts in this way, it actually forms a covalent bond. So we see this CH. adds this. Again, we'll make sure we add in our methyl groups. 
All right, so one of the things we learned about in the curved area handouts, we have to, have, we have to conserve the charge, so we start off with a positive charge, we end up with one. All right, so this is molecule four in this step. And so basically we've added uh, water to this, and it becomes really what we call a protonated alcohol group. All right, so that is the COH would be an alcohol. We have an extra proton on there. We call that a protonated alcohol. Well, this is also referred to, this species in general, as an alkyl oxonium ion. Weird name, but we can break it down. Um, alkyl, because it's, a, again, a carbon group. Oxo is a, is a name, like a prefix name for oxygen. All right, so it's oxonium, and so it has a positive charge. So this is alkyl oxonium, and then it's ion that forms. All right, and so this alkyl oxonium ion is, again, another intermediate. All right, so we haven't quite got to the product, so this is another, another intermediate, um, and it's a protonated alcohol. Ooh, get rid of that. And so as a result, uh, this thing is actually a fairly strong acid. Not a fairly strong, but a really strong acid because um, this compound would be most stable if it just had an OH, and if it can get rid of this hydrogen, it will, and become more stable. So the alkyl-oxonium ions in general are strong acids. We'll see some numbers to prove that in just a second, uh, but nonetheless, we get to that uh, stage. All right, so this is yet another intermediate. Again, notice we haven't drawn, as I said on the last slide, the bromine. The bromine is not no longer associated uh, with the mechanism. It's a spectator ion. All right, so this is, uh, and again, so again, this alcohol oxonium ion is the conjugate acid of an alcohol, and so it's really a strong acid that readily deprotonates. We get rid of a hydrogen, and we'll see that on the next step. All right, but again, noticing that, of course, this reaction is an equilibrium, uh, e relatively equal equilibrium arrows, meaning it can go back and forth with uh, relative ease. Now let's talk about this alkyl oxonium ion just a second more. Um, we see that uh, figure of it here, and again, RO, if this guy would actually re uh, be attracted to a hydrogen, we would actually form this. And of course, the, in this case, the water reacted with the carbon group, and we got this. And so the equilibrium is going to lie generally in that direction. Let's, uh, to give you a sense of the, how strong this is, let's think about um, some species and their pKa's. All right, so we've seen this term before. All right, so let's think about an acid like HCl. Its pKa is negative 7. And remember, the, more, the smaller the number, the more negative, the stronger an acid it is. Well, if we think about the alkyl oxonium ion, it has a pKa of right around negative 2.4. All right, so it's fairly strong. Compare that to something like water, which we know is a fairly weak acid. I mean, it's not really what we consider an acid, but it, it, can't, it does have acid properties. It has a pKa value of 15. And then if you compare that to a methyl group as an H, so we're really looking at this carbon-hydrogen uh, dissociation, the pKa value, that would be a positive 50. All right, so you get a sense here of the scale. So this might be, you know, the weakest acid of them all. Water is sort of a weak acid, but at least has something. Alkyl oxonium ion starts to approach uh, the strength, really, of HCl. All right, so it's a really strong acid, meaning that it's really willing to deprotonate and get rid of this hydrogen, all right, so this alkyl oxonium ion. And that's really what happens then in this last step that we're going to talk about um, for this uh, step number three for this alkyl oxonium ion breaking down. All right, so let's redraw that. Oftentimes on a, in a classroom, on a typical chalkboard, I would just write this all the way across the chalkboard, and sometimes uh, there's so many steps that you know, it can't fit exactly just straight across on one chalkboard. So, but on the, in this video lecture, I need to do it across a couple of screens, but as you type, as you um, write it out, and that's a great idea to write it out, you would have one above the other. All right, so again, this is that species four, the same alkyl oxonium ion that we drew on the last page. Well, what happens here? Well, again, we have equilibrium arrows that exist. Remember, we still have a lot of water around. All right, so water is the solvent. This is a hydrolysis, and so it's willing to react, and it can react, and to help deprotonate this alkyl oxonium ion. So again, a pair of these electrons come over. They react here. This goes back, and then what happens is that we end up with our compound. An 
alcohol here, so we'll call this compound five, and then we end up with hydronium, which is, you know, your typical native uh, natural species of an acid, All right? And so then this is our alcohol, and this really is our, what we consider our product. All right, it's our alcohol product uh, that ultimately forms. Noticing, of course, that this step, equilibrium arrows, uh, relatively fast. Remember, we said the first step was slow. That second step that we just saw was fast, and this one is fairly fast. And notice that it's fairly uh, e strong equilibrium that it can go back, because, again, this is a fairly decent acid as well, so it sort of pushes these, uh, can go back and forth. Uh, but nonetheless, forming this alcohol, uh, alcohol product that we see here. All right, so overall, this would be the step that we saw, so it ended up being three steps. There are three transition states. A good way to see uh, this reaction is to plot the energy diagram for it. All right, we can use our numbers, and plotting this energy diagram helps us just see how this process proceeds. It helps us understand the relative energy of the reactants and the products. All right, so we can plot our energy, this potential energy. So remember the higher potential energy. Uh, that's more unstable, lower potential energy is more stable against the reaction coordinate, RC, and that's just showing us going from reactants to the intermediates to the products. All right, so this might look something like this, where we go through our first transition state, forming our intermediate. This drops down. All right, so we can fill in our numbers. So one was our reactant. Um, and that was the, the tertiary bromine group. As it reacted, the carbon bromine group broke away, and that gave us number two. And then we got our first intermediate, which is the carbocation, number three. It continues to react, and again, notice that we have to go uphill to break, a, to break or form a bond um, that occurs. And to, to add and to those, uh, as, the, as the carbocation is reacting with the water, so that requires some energy for those electrons to come together. Um, then we end up forming uh, compound four, which is our alkyl oxonium ion. In order for it to deprotonate, we have to form, uh, we have to go through a transition state and finally form in our product. All right, so we can see that overall, this is a favorable process of going from one to five, but along the way, we have to go through uh, some transition states, and, uh, and those require energy going up, all right, and, uh, and that allows us to break bonds and then or and, and to rearrange structures and molecules, and that's what that energy is involved for. So anytime we're breaking bonds, um, we always have to put energy in. And so we see that also with this carbocation, no true bonds broken, but nonetheless rearranging some structure, and that requires a little bit of potential energy as those rearrange and forming this. All right, so these energy diagrams are a great way uh, for us to see these uh, mechanisms. Right, in terms of the energy of them. So remembering, of course, this was with the, really the solvolysis reaction. It's an SM1 mechanism. And remember, this is substitution, nucleophilic, unimolecular. All right, so we were substituting, in our case, an OH group for a bromine. We did it because of a nucleophile. The nucleophile is the solvent water, and it's unimolecular, meaning that really the rate of the reaction only depends on that very first thing, that is the substrate carbon number one, or compound number one with a carbon bromine bond, and if you increase the concentration of that substrate, then the reaction increases. However, because the solvent water is present so high, even if you try to increase the concentration of that water, it really wouldn't um, change the, the reaction rate. All right, so this is our SM1 mechanism.